welcome everybody to the Cone of Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here with veterinary cardiologist, Dr. Kristen McDonald today. Uh, we are talking about cardiology myths. We are walking through uh, a little bit about heart murmurs, a lot about heart failure, a lot about communicating the heart failure to clients, a lot about managing heart failure. We talk a bit about uh, spiralactone and why it has become so popular in cardiology. And, uh, and it's all sort of presented in the format of myths and legends that I have heard and mostly I've seen online with pet owner groups, things like that, pet owner discussions. And I'm just putting it out to her and seeing how she communicates about these things and really what the truth is. So anyway, this is a super fun uh, episode. It is a great bite-sized chunk episode. We just clip from one subject to the next subject to the next subject. It'll definitely hold your attention. You're definitely gonna pick up some pearls along the way. Kristen is amazing. Was so glad to have her. Guys, this episode is brought to you by Siva Animal Health. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Kristen McDonald. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Andy? I am so great. I am so glad that you are here. I have been looking forward to getting to sit down and talk with you a bit. For those who do not know you, you are a clinical cardiologist at VCA Animal Care Center in Sonoma, California. You are a huge outdoorsman, which I love, and you live in a beautiful place for it. Um, you are also, uh, you have two daughters, just just like I do, and you're teaching one of them to drive just like I am. I feel like we're living parallel lives, except for the whole cardiology thing. Um, you are also uh, a lecturer. You are uh, doing the VCA lecture series all across the United States. Uh, people can find you all over the place in your presentations. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for making time to be here. Um, I have, I've got a fun game and it is, um, I wanted to share with you some cardiology myths. I want to make some bold statements and I want you to shoot them down. So, um, yeah, I, I want to go ahead and lay out some, some things that I am starting to hear or things that have kind of floated around the internet. And I just want you to kind of weigh in on some of the modern cardiology legends. Is that okay? That sounds great. All right, great. So, uh, first thing I'm going to start with is, um, talk to me, uh, so, Talk to me a bit about uh, pet owners that are concerned about their dog having a heart attack. And so I see a lot in people like, I've heard people say that dogs don't have heart attacks. I'm like, that, that dogs don't have heart attacks. I'm like, well, they do. And then people talk about heart failure and they'll use heart attack interchangeably. Like, oh, well, the doctor says he's going to have a heart attack. And I'm like, I don't, nobody did that. Talk to me a bit about heart attacks in dogs uh, and that terminology, if you don't mind. Well, most clients actually equate heart disease in dogs to what they might suffer in human cardiology, which is a heart attack. And it really is not the same thing. So uh, dogs have a lot of different heart diseases, some that are in common with people, but um, they don't have coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. And I'm guessing it's because we probably feed them better than we eat ourselves. Uh, looking at my diet lately yeah. of lots of pastries and French fries on vacation, uh, my dog's yeah. eating way better than me. So yeah. there are certain things that may look like a heart attack that they may uh, cling to, like in severe forms, you know, their pet might be short of breath or breathing hard or coughing or, you know, collapsing. And so those things look like a heart attack, but it's actually a very different process, still a severe process. Um, so we try to explain the actual heart disease that we think is going on with our pets so they can better understand it. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, the grain-free heart disease was everywhere. Like it, it was a huge thing. It blew up. There was much conversation about grain-free diets and their uh, interaction with heart disease and things like that. That uh, that seems to have quieted way down. We don't hear a whole lot about grain-free diet associated dilated cardiomyopathy anymore. Is that over? Is uh, is grain-free diet heart disease a thing of the past? It is not over. It's just not front and center on people's minds. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there are still cases of this. Um, this was first described back in 2018 when we started seeing dogs 
that weren't supposed to have dilated cardiomyopathy, like little dogs that yeah. never get that disease. And we we're looking at common threads. And sure enough, it was these grain free diets that seemed to be emerging as this common factor. So there was this frenzy of learning and reporting to the FDA, which was a very arduous process for clients. It could take 30 minutes for them to have to fill out all this information. And there gets to be fatigue in the process and fatigue with investigators. So there's still ongoing active research. But um, I think that maybe the word has gotten out and maybe there's been some reformulation of different diets. But there's also... Um, very sneaky ways that companies are sort of jading the term grain free. And so they may call it grain friendly, but they still may have the same potentially toxic ingredients. We're learning that it's the legume family, like peas. And so they might call it grain friendly, where it's more approachable. But they still kept the peas in it. So we still are finding dogs with this and they can die from it. That's Changing the diet and treating for heart disease in these dogs can make a dramatic improvement in their outcomes. That's so it's still around. <laughs> I can't. I just I can't fathom. But no, I've seen grain friendly, and I'm like, oh, clearly they have addressed the yeah. concerns. But you say, but not necessarily. No, that you have to look absolutely. at. Now it's harder. You can't just look at the the title of the diet. You actually have to look at the ingredients list. Um, it's oh. very complicated. Oh man, that's uh, that's I'm not to sit with that. That's amazing. Um, talk to me about um about having seizures with heart problems. So I've uh, I've had pet owners. I've seen posts on the internet where pet owners are like, "Yeah, my dog have heart disease and now he has seizures." How do you talk to people about seizures when their dog has heart disease? This is or their something... perception of seizures. Yeah. Oh yes, this is something. Now, I full disclosure, I'm married to a veterinary neurologist, so yeah. this is a sensitive subject here, and okay, we I'm also sure. happen to work in the same practice, so we're often jockeying for whose case is this. Um, you're, but... you're, well, hold on to jump in. Your <laughs> father is also a veterinary dermatologist. Yes, is that true? It's like, oh, Thanksgiving's family. at your house. Yeah. <laughs> There was oh. one um, actual Ettinger um, textbook that the three of us all had chapters in it, and the table of contents had us in sequential order. That's got to be <laughs> a record. Cool. That has to be a record. That's super cool. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. So, but it's yeah, back to every time an animal has something where it looks like they collapse, they may lose consciousness, they may have some tonic clonic movement. Um, they almost always call it a seizure. And there, you know, it's very difficult, even in the best trained eyes and education, to differentiate them. I've actually seen a dog in the ICU with an EKG on that went into a horrible VTAC, collapsed and fainted, and then had uh, myoclonic movements that looked exactly like a seizure, but I had the EKG on and he had minimal blood flow and it was syncope. So of course, an untrained client would think it's seizure, but um, you know, you got to think twice about that. And it's hard for the GP because they've got to decide completely different directions to go. Is this a, a really malignant cardiac event or is this neurologic? Who do I send this to or what treatment right. should I start? Um, so it can be tricky um, because they can have similar appearances. But there's a few things that I'm going to look for. I'm going to look at, is there an inciting cause for syncope? It might be that it's uh, excitable or exertion related or mm -hmm. triggered by a cough, or maybe it's a small breed dog with chronic respiratory clinical signs um, and murmurs. Um, Whereas uh, for, for seizure, it may be more likely at night when they're resting and they may have different behaviors before and after, but it can be super tricky. But generally when a client says it's a seizure, I, I would urge you guys to dig in deeper, get a little more info, look at your patient signalman and decide which direction should we go. And if, if there's any questions, I'd, I'd be dialing up your favorite cardiologist or neurologist and tell them about it. Yeah. Ask for so a video. Yeah, I love. Well, I love the video suggestion, and it's always I, this is always interesting because it really is the clinical history, you know, and asking the questions and kind of digging in. Um, do you still put halter monitors on dogs that you are playing around with syncope? Is that still a sort of a, st a standard of care? That, oh that you yes. For? 
So for sure, the first thing we're going to start with is a, for in my cardiology practice is we're going to do a really comprehensive echocardiogram. We're going to yep. look for pulmonary hypertension, especially in small breed dogs, really common cause of syncope. We're going to have an EKG on, but you never look into that aha moment. That's yeah. when we really lean on the Holter monitor where we may place it for a day or even up to seven days to try to document arrhythmia. And maybe we can catch the event um, and actually show whether it is from an arrhythmia or not. And then that will uh, implicate your treatment because we have many great drugs out there, antiarrhythmic meds or even pacemakers we'll use uh, in dogs to really cure the problem. Yeah. There's um there's a lot of conversation when I look online and I look at pet owners that are talking about their pets with heart disease and things like that. There's a lot of fear, you know. Um so yeah. so one of the you know, one of the questions I have honestly seen online is you know, people say, My dog has a heart murmur. Does that mean he's going to die? And so how do you I again I think I, I bring this up because I, I think all of us in, in vet practice, we see heart murmurs all the time and we know that, but I think sometimes we take it for granted that that the pet owners they're gonna understand when we we don't act like it's a big deal, so they're gonna understand it's not a big deal. But I don't think that's necessarily true. How do you talk to pet owners about about heart disease, uh having about their heart murmur, which um can hit them, you know, like a hammer when they go, what do you mean my little dog has, yeah. you know, has a heart? What do you mean her heart has a valve that's not working the way it should? You know, uh, how, how do you, how, what is that conversation like with you? Well, you guys actually, you catch it first. So I feel for you very much um, because <laughs> yeah. you, you're the, you're the revealer. And then oh, I, know. I, yeah. I, I have clients that come in and they are on the ledge. They are holding their breath. They are wringing their hands. You can see every bit of body language is fear. Uh, yeah. The dog's not afraid. The cat's not afraid as much, but the client's terrified. So yeah. I love it when I can come back into the room after we've done our workup, you know, literally 25 minutes later and say, you know, one of my first things is, you know, we're, we're okay here. Um, and so it's really discussing that, a murmur doesn't mean your dog is going to die. And in fact, the odds are greatly in your, your dog's or your cat's favor that they're going to be okay. Um, but this can get worse over time. And if we're talking about the number one cause of murmurs in dogs, it's going to be mitral valve disease, which, yes, this can get worse over years of life. But Again, if you're a betting person, two thirds of dogs are going to live full lives with mitral valve disease. So it's kind of giving them a little bit of reassurance and also committing them to the fact that, yeah, things can go wrong and we need to stay on top of this. And that means we need to proactively, prospectively watch these dogs and, and really monitor them to know when do we need to get worried and when do we need to start medications? Because um, certainly heart, heart disease is not always benign and it can, it can really progress to become problematic. How do you, how do you handle the pet owners who, I mean, again, so uh, we talked about heart murmurs. When we start talking about heart failure, I have had clients come up to me or people who aren't my clients, they talk to another vet and it's almost like they have a question they're embarrassed to ask their vet. So they say, heart failure, like, that means he's going to die, right? Like heart failure is dead. Like you can't live if your heart yeah. fails. So, yeah. And he's in heart failure. Does that mean he's dying? And so I, unpack I that literally me. had that happen to me last week. I kid you not. Right before this podcast, wow. I was like, oh, this is it. This is a, this is definitely a, a myth that we need to dispel um, yeah. that, you know, heart failure is concerning. It's a scary word because oh, this terrifying. is a big deal. I mean, this is not a benign process typically, um, but it doesn't mean your dog is dying on the floor in front of us. It means that your dog has severe heart disease, severe enough that it cannot function properly such that fluid will build up in the lungs or in the abdomen, or maybe they have really low blood flow so that they're really tired going on walks or they're coughing and breathing hard. And that yes, heart failure, there are medications to help it, just like in people. And I think they may relate to that. They know like, oh, I, I have a lot of clients who go, 
well, I have heart failure. I'm on that med. And so it almost makes them a little more comfortable to know Mm -hmm. we can treat this, but yes, overall, the, the, there is a accelerated um, time course compared to people that can live with heart failure for 10 years, 20 years in dogs. I mean, it is sad about, uh, you know, most dogs with mitral valve disease and heart failure may live on average a year. Um, then again, we have some great success stories for longer. And for dilated cardiomyopathy, it's even shorter. So there is this, in my approach, it's an honest, um, gentle um, preparation for them. So that there, we're not sugarcoating things. We're not mm-hmm. trying to um, diverge from the truth, but we're trying to support them and let them know what might happen, what it might look like. They always want to know. What's it going to look like? What's the yeah. end going to look like? And and I think it's really helpful to discuss what it could be like um, with breathing difficulty, that maybe it's a phone call, kind of things are getting worse, or maybe it's a crisis and you need yeah. to get help urgently. Do you think that you can have those honest conversations about what heart failure looks like and then still have sort of a voice of optimism? Yeah, absolutely. I think that... Um, you know, I try to talk about that this is treatable and kind of a plan for what this looks like. But then we do have to talk about when things don't go right. Mm-hmm. But also the fact that even if we we have a dog that represents with heart failure, it doesn't mean that we can't make more adjustments and get more quality time. Um, and I also think it helps with buy-in for medications because um, in veterinary medicine, we don't have so much success or there's not as much availability of valve replacement. So really the mainstay of treatment um, across country is medical therapy. And so if they know this is a deadly disease and we worry most about how they feel, that medications are going to help deliver that improvement as best as we can. And we need them to be compliant and follow up and know what to look for that are concerns to let us know so we can be proactive. Well, speaking of medical therapy, one of the things that I have seen in the last 16, I have never seen since I was in vet school and learned about spiralactone. I have not put much thought into spiralactone until about 16 months ago when I started to really hear an uptick about conversations about spiralactone. And so the uh, the debate that I've seen online, which is actually, again, this is in pet owner forums, but it's interesting, but people are like, you know, um, if you got Lasix, that's so much stronger. You don't like, you don't need spiralactone if you got Lasix. And so let me put that to you as a as a potential myth that's out there. How do you feel about that? I, I too was educated that it's a weak diuretic and really at that time until about hmm, a year and a half ago, I've been waiting for the data. I like data. I think it's reassuring. It helps me to know, is this worth it or not? Um, and so we're looking at effects within oftentimes like mitral valve disease and heart failure and really we're thinking about spironolactone is not a diuretic. We're thinking about it kind of like an ACE inhibitor, where it's more of a renin angiotensin aldosterone system blocker. So it's blocking aldosterone receptors. And so we think of it more in that neurohormonal antagonism rather than its effect on increasing urinary output. And, you know, there are definitely um, benefits that have been shown when you add spironolactone to benazepril, that mm-hmm. these dogs, they had a lot longer time before heart failure worsened and they lived longer and they had less um you know, time to what they call um, all cause removal or all cause um, problems. So it's very safe and effective. And we're learning that it's not all about just how much urination they're going to have and diuresis to have an an actual benefit. Um, But again, it's not a one or or the other. The beautiful part is that we, we can use multiple medications that each have their own job to cumulatively get the benefit. Well, tell me more about that. Talk, talk to me a bit about quad therapy. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the term quad therapy in our cardiac cases and things. So why don't you, can you define that for me is what that means in, uh, to you? And then sort of start to make the case for a quad therapy approach. Yeah. So 
you know, when I, I think we all talked about triple therapy when um, Pimo Bendin became available. So mm -hmm. we had, of course, our standard furosemide loop diuretic, pulls uh, the fluid from the lungs. We've got ACE inhibitors, which are blocking the conversion of angiotensin 1 to 2. And earlier studies showed improvement in heart failure class and double survival time. So that was back in the 80s to 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. Then came Pimobendin, this revolutionary drug that has honestly changed the face of cardiology. It's yeah. made us have a lot more fun and a lot better outcomes. Yeah, it should um, be in the water. A lot, a lot of happy, happy dogs and clients with this drug being an inodilator. So what we're looking at is I describe it to owners as this is the one that helps the heart function better and dilates the vessels, both going out to the body and back to the lungs. So this really helps heart failure of many causes. Um, and of course, that one demonstrated again, improvement in survival time and time to heart failure recurrence. All of that is really uh, something we're looking for. So now, now comes on the scene, um, spironolactone. And we just had this best clinical trial that I kind of honestly was waiting for. Um, and what that is looking at is blocking aldosterone receptors with spironolactone. And what aldosterone is a toxic neurohormone. And unfortunately, when dogs or cats are placed on ACE inhibitors, we want to believe that there will be less angiotensin II made, which then lessens production of aldosterone. Well, that's, that's logical, but the body has different workarounds. And so about 40 to 50% of animals, people um, they have this aldosterone breakthrough where we still have elevated uh, toxic aldosterone circulating in the body that's wreaking havoc on the cardiovascular system. So we're looking at now blocking both the uh, ACE system and aldosterone. And I think of it as kind of like, like peanut butter and jelly, or actually it'd be more like chocolate and peanut butter for me, the perfect combination, yeah, um, really for more comprehensive um, blockade. Is it hard to get clients to buy into quad therapy? I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about giving a, a number of different medications. If someone were to make the case and they were like, you know, it's better to do fewer things the client will actually do. Yeah. Uh, how, do how do you feel about that? It like, is shoot that, shoot very that sound tricky. For me if you can. Yeah. It's, it is a tricky, tricky thing. And unfortunately, a lot of these dogs are coming to me and have never even seen Pimo Benden yet. And so they may be on no medications and they come in for a little cough. They think they've got kennel cough. Things are great. And then I'm telling them their dog has congestive heart failure and may live for a year. This yeah. is a lot to handle. So then we start talking about quad therapy, four different drugs. And some clients will get worried like, well, is it safe? Is it toxic? drugs might be toxic. Well, yes, we do have to follow kidney values and all, but they are very safe. Um, but then comes the reality of implementation. So how compliant might a client be able to uh, be with four different medications given often twice a day? And unfortunately, doctors they want to believe they have the perfect pupils that will do everything perfectly. <laughs> but I think we may be uh, perfect cases that humans um, are going to mess up and they're going to be busy and they are going to have a lot of other stuff on their plate. So, you know, looking at um, a lot of clients say they cannot handle giving more than three meds. They say, I, I can't even do two meds a day. Mm -hmm. um, and about 30% said they could give at most three meds a day um, and, and that they couldn't handle more. Um, so, I often look at, there's a, a nice combination tablet where we have both uh, benazoprol and spironolactone in one tablet given once a day. And so I kind of, I don't sneak it in. I just say, well, we've got three medications your pet's going to go home on. Little, And I sort of say, by the way, one of them happens to have a two-in-one. Um, so it makes it a little easier for them to handle. And um, it is, it's even easier if they've already come in on Pimobendin for preclinical, say, heart enlargement. And then I say, well, we're just going to add two more medications that are going to help the heart failure part of things. Um, yeah. But it is very tricky. 
The other part is, um, will the pet take the medication? Maybe the client is absolutely on board. They are dependable. They know they've been educated to say, this is how your dog is going to have a good life and live longer. Um, But we have to give the med or it's not going to work. Well, talking pet language, you're dog or cat may not agree with that. So we've got to make sure they know how to give the med. Maybe they may may need reminders or training on that. Um, So there's some great apps out there. I mean, there's apps for everything these days, but I do love the Cardalis app because it helps them monitor breathing rates and it has medication reminders. Um, And you can have multiple pets. And I do have families that have like three animals in heart failure all at once. So just giving them the tools to help them with the delivery. I love it. Dr. Krista McDonald, thank you so much for being here. You are so wonderful. Where, uh, where can people learn more from you? Where can they find you online or in the future? I might be a bit of a dinosaur, uh, but <laughs> I don't, I have a LinkedIn and I don't check it that much, no, but really VCA Animal Care Center of Sonoma and um, LinkedIn. But overall, I also go incognito because online, I, I have a Facebook that's my own personal Facebook uh, with last name Lavely. So oh, okay. um, yeah, but probably through VCA, I am actually going to have a really fun time weekend before school starts. My daughters and I are going to go to Vet Girl U down in Scottsdale at oh, the, hey. the Princess. And we're going to have a great time with my mom-in-law. And oh, man. so, yeah, you guys should check it out. Yes. Uh, Vet Girl U, Justine Lee and Garrett Pattinger uh, are good friends of mine, founder of nice. Vet Girl. Just wonderful people. They've got a great event. They have a great culture. I just, I think the world of them. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm awesome. excited. Thank well, you. Thank you. Guys, take care of yourselves, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that's it. That's what I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Real quick before you go, I got to give you a fast heads up. I have a Race CE webinar coming right at you very soon. Uh, it is called The Practical Guide to the Mitral Valve Patient. This is with my friend, Dr. Natalie Marks. It is on November 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 1 p.m. Pacific. It is sponsored by Siva Animal Health. Um, Guys, I've worked with Natalie many times. She's been on this podcast many times. She is absolutely great, super practical, uh, a really wonderful doctor to learn from. This is going to be packed full of pearls. Like I said, free hour, race CE, jump in and grab it. Link is in the uh, show notes. Get on it fast because this is going to pass us by real quick. Anyway, coming at you. I'd love to see you there. And that's what I got for you today. Take care of yourselves, everybody. See you later.